Thanks, and Paul. Evening, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Simon Brown, doing this evening's presentation. Big deal for this evening. New Just One Lap logo. You're the first folks to see it. Um, it'll officially be launched with a new website. Uh, we love it. We hope that you all love it too. So, Warren Buffett says it best, and I start all my prediction shows with this. Predictions tell you more about the person than they do about the future. My ability to see into the future is exactly the same as anybody else's. It's zero. We, 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 t we make what we politely call educated guesses, otherwise known as stabs in the dark. <clears throat> in truth, we have something, I'm going to go back to there, called recency bias. And recency bias, it's a cognitive disorder which is good and bad. What's bad about it is that we always assume that what has been happening will continue to happen. We assume that the state that we are in now, that is it forever and a day, and there will never be a change. And that, frankly, is not true. We know that. Things change. Not just markets, everything changes. Some things slowly, some things quickly. But that's the good part about recency bias, perhaps, is that in markets, ten, things tend to change slower than we think. We're always in a hurry. We always think that the stock has gone too high. It's time to come back. Uh, that was my claim to fame on NASPASS at 248 Rand. Um, we think a stock has gone too low. It can't go any lower. And that's what someone told me on African Bank at 12 Rand 50. And so it goes on. So in the one sense, we've got to be careful about you know, wanting to change too quickly. But we've got to be prepared that the trends tend to continue. You'll see a lot of what my talk this evening is around saying, things are carrying on. Um, and in certain places, there will be shifts. Those are the critical ones. But first, if we're going to do this, we've got to establish some credibility or lack thereof. So let's look at, at, at my last year's predictions, and let's run through them quickly. Uh, I said Rand would go through 1250. Um, in truth, I'd said that the year before. I was wrong, but this year I was way right. Weaker Rand, driven quite simply by people, foreigners who have South African assets, selling those assets and taking the money offshore to buy other assets, predominantly America. With all respect, why invest in an emerging market and aim for 10 or 15% when you can invest in the U.S. market and get 10 or 15%? Of course, you didn't get 10 or 15% in the U.S. this year. You got flat, but that was the thinking. We saw a weaker currency. ESCOM woes uh, continue. And that, so the, a year ago, it was really, really dark and ugly and quite very scary. And in fact, when I spoke about ESCOM, I just had a black screen. And I said, that seems to be our future. In truth, ESCOM seems maybe a little bit better, but, but there isn't enough wood for us to touch when we say that. And we do, I mean, load shedding's not quite there anymore, although it's always in the back of our minds. So ESCOM's partly there, um, and we'll come back to it more in time. Strike action. Not as bad as, as, as previous years, but we're still seeing uh, militant labor, and we'll talk a lot about why and the implications for that and what that means going forward. I said local stocks are going to be under pressure. I said you want global assets, whether they be moving money offshore, which is one route, but you can buy JSC listed companies that give you offshore. There's the Deutsche Bank X trackers, there's Richmond, there's NASPASS, there's SAB Miller, and so the list goes on. Um, <clears throat> I'd said top 40 single digit at best. I said commodities remain under pressure. And that was, when, I, when people asked me for one single prediction for, for, for 2015, I always said commodities remain under pressure. This story is not changing in a hurry. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'll talk more about that. But, but commodities certainly remain under pressure, and I don't think that's going to change in a hurry. I said interest rates, there will be no increase from the U.S., and so far I'm right. Janet Yellen might prove me wrong on Wednesday, but that's Wednesday. As of today, <laughs> hey, I get to pick the date, eh? I scheduled this event. As of today, there's been no U.S. increase. And at this point, it's like, but you've got to understand, a year ago, the talk was, I mean, the betting was an increase in the first quarter, guaranteed. And then it was, oh, okay, second quarter, uh, and now we're in December, and we might just, just get it. The tragedy is I have a bet riding on this, and the bet is on the calendar year, and it's a bottle of Japanese whiskey. And I don't mind losing bets, but I hate losing bets in the last 12 days of the year. But anyway, that's between me and Janet. And I said, don't worry about a crash. Now, if you remember a year ago, and it, it wasn't that long ago, a year ago, the, the, the concern, the fear, the talk, the hype was, this market's going to crash. We're in for a, forget bear markets, we're going to crash, we're going to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I stood up here a year ago and said, no, I, I, you know, 
not that we won't, but that don't ever worry about a market crash. Because the only people who predict them wake up every morning and say, today the market will crash. And then one day, it does crash. And they say, you see, I told you. And they did tell you. Yes, I agree, every day. Markets will crash. Some people will predict them. Yes, but is there any reliability to it? No. I, the, 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 um, I forget his name. He predicted the crash of 1987 in his newsletter, which he wrote in January of that year. But if you go back, he'd been predicting a crash since 1976. 11th time, he was right. Markets crash. Mostly, and that's what the, the, the comic there is, is illustrating, markets are irrational, crazy places. And, and that's what we deal with. Which makes any attempt at trying to, to, to predict and throw into the future significantly harder. But certainly irrational and crazy places. So on that, I mean, I, I think I did fairly well. I, I frankly want to give myself 100%. You might argue we can fiddle and diddle. But, but mostly I got it right, which means I got very lucky, which means we're hoping lightning strikes twice. Um, these were the stocks I told you to buy last year. Uh, all of them did lacquer. Well, uh, Richmond, 2%. I don't know if we can call that lacquer. Um, could have been worse. You could have owned Lonman. And I'm going to come back to them. Uh, top 40, and I'm doing 12 months as of Friday. I'm not doing year today. 12 months as of Friday. Top 40 was slightly green. So nice returns. MTN, the one disappointment. I have sold my MTNs. My grandfather taught me that a key point is know when it's time to panic. And when it is time to panic, panic quick. In other words, when it's time to panic, you want to be the first person at the door, not the fifth or the sixth. So I sold my MTNs at about 175 rand. Um, and for me, it's less about what's happening to the MTN share price. It's more about MTN management. And my view on MTN management is really simple. When you are a telco, you have one person you care about, your regulator. You take them an apple every morning. You buy them flowers on their birthday. You take them cake at Christmas. You get them Easter eggs. You love your regulator. And when your regulator says to you, disconnect 5.2 million users for whatever reason, you disconnect them. Except your MTN. And you get fined 5.2 billion, and then you disconnect them. And that, to me, shows a, a, a middle finger to their regulator. And when you MTN, the regulator is the only thing in your life that matters, and you cannot afford to show them a middle finger. It shows to me a culture of management that I am not interested in. I want to own outstanding companies. Not companies that make me money. I want outstanding companies. Richmond, famous brands, Capitec, Colgra M3, outstanding companies. MTN, thanks, but not for me. Uh, quite simply. So I didn't take all of the 39% hit on MTN, but I certainly took enough of that hit on, on MTN. And now, with the typo of last week, unfortunately, the, the Nigerian regulator is now looking, frankly, as dodgy as MTN. So that was 2015 predictions. The show we did a year ago, uh, right here in December, went nice. Now for 2016, when things get a little more tricky, because now we're not looking back, which is easy and fun, now we're doing the looking forward part. So key themes coming through, Rand. The canaries are the classic canary in a gold mine. You had a canary in a gold mine, because when the carbon monoxide was there, the canary died first. When the canary started dying, you didn't know why, but you knew it was time to get the heck out of the gold mine. And that, in a sense, is what our Rand is. The Rand is almost, in a sense, our canary. So when the rand weakens out massively, it's people fleeing our currency. Why? Because what are they doing? They're selling rands. More sellers than buyers, and the rand weakens. The question is, where does it go now? So this is a 15-year chart. And you can see massive blowout in 2001, fairly bad blowout in 2008. But each time, we recovered. A grinding recovery, but we recovered. The question is, are we going to recover this time? Now, this was not a blowout. This was a gentle, gradual collapse, actually starting in the third quarter of 2011. So it's been a four-year grind from the currency. My sense is overdone. I think it's going to start to come back. I think it's going to improve. Are we going to get to 1250 in 2016? That's fairly ambitious in a prediction. But I do think that we're going to see a better round. I do think this is one of those trends which is going to turn. The risk is... I suppose twofold. One, I'm just wrong. And this time next year, the rand's at 20, and I'm like, well, okay. The other risk is that it turns, but when does it turn? 
Now, just good old-fashioned look at that chart. Yeah, it, it's, looking, it's looking overextended. The question is, what makes it turn? What makes it turn is money coming into our country. Simple as that, money coming in. Whether it be foreign direct investment, whether it be people buying our bonds, whether it be asset managers buying our equity, whether it be enough holiday makers, although that would have to be a lot of holiday makers, <clears throat> or maybe just the Zuckerbergs. But if we can get enough money flowing into the country, and I gotta say, I look at 2016, and it's hard to see a lot of money coming into this country. There's not a lot to be massively optimistic for. Except that at some point, our markets are starting, are gonna to start to become more attractive and cheaper. And I'm gonna come into that in a bit. But I think that at some point, Iran's gonna start becoming stronger. I'm putting a head in the block and say it'll start to happen in 2016. I have my get out of jail free card, and I only have one, and I'm using it right up front. If we get downgraded to junk, or bets are off. Quite simply, if we get downgraded to junk, there are a number of asset managers who own our bonds who will no longer be allowed to own our bonds. Their mandate doesn't allow them to own junk, which means they are forced sellers of our bonds, and having sold the bonds, they're gonna take their money back home to Paris, London, New York, Moscow, wherever it might be, and that will further weaken our currency. Will we get downgraded to junk? I don't know. I, I, th th that is beyond my remit of being able to work out. I think uh, Minister Nkanklanene will do everything he can, um, but there's a lot that he's fighting against, and we'll touch on some of those in, in a moment. But it's going to be a, a, a tough call. Assuming no junk, I think Iran's overdone. I think we'll start seeing some correction. The 1250 might be very aggressive for next year, but I do think we're currently, I mean, let's pin it, we're at 1435. I think we'll be better off in a year's time than we are at that point there which means plan your holidays for 2017. ESCOM, look, the damage is done. Uh, the question is, is that light a train or the end of a tunnel? I think it's the end of a tunnel. Brian Malefe seems to be doing a fairly decent job. Uh, we will get more power. The key thing is that our demand for electricity has disappeared from two areas, manufacturing and mining. The fact that we turn our kettle off or, or, or whatever we do at home um, is very nice, but that doesn't, that doesn't save one iota of electricity in truth. I mean, how many kettles can we turn off? The point is that our manufacturing sector is dead, our mining sector is almost dead, and they are the two big users of electricity. And that's just it. And with them pretty much out the picture, the demand for electricity has disappeared. And this has given ESCOM breathing room. Yes, Brian Malef has done some stuff that has helped. Um, yes, we'll start seeing Madupi. And then in time, Khaleesi, will, the power stations will come on. And that will all start to happen. Um, so it's kind of better. We're not getting the load shedding we were worried about. You know, four times a week, no power, gridlock in Santon, that, I mean, your best bet is abandon your car and buy a bicycle and stuff like that. Um, but it is, and if you are a global whatever, you make widgets, and you can build a widget factory anywhere in the world, and you have a list of things that you need in order to build widgets, one of the non-negotiables on that list is electricity. Electricity is not a nice to have. Electricity is like if we don't have electricity and security of electricity. So you can do it. You can, I mean, the, 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 the Mondis and the Lovos and the Tongots are doing biomass and the like, and, 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 and you know, the com co companies are sort of trying to manage the way around it. But the damage from ESCOM is done. I mean, if anything, the, 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 the future from ESCOM is probably better news. The really bad news is behind us. And, and, and that damage has been done in that, if, you know, foreign direct investment is like, yeah, we love you guys, but uh, we're not sure about our security of power. Labor. So 2014 was Marikana. We had humongous five-man strikes in the, in the Rustenburg Platinum Belts, um, which have significantly hurt the mining industry, although truth, the mining industry that has been hurt for a bunch of other reasons aside from it. Um, what we're seeing at the moment are the final, the final dance post-midnight of the Tripartite Alliance. Um, the ANC, Kusatu, and the South African Communist Party, who in truth were never happy bedfellows. Firstly, the communists, well, they're communists. They want to do what communists do, which if you look at Bladen Zamunde, with all respect to the minister, is drive luxury German sedans and drink expensive wine. Um, the the Kusatu want 
absolutely to advocate for the workers and the blue-collar workers. And the ANC, in truth, is a white-collar organization. The ANC is not a worker organization. They're civil servants. They're white-collars. And they were in bed together because it was useful in the 80s, the UDF, all of this. This is what it came from. Um, it never made sense in a post-apartheid South Africa that they, were, they, they should have been agitating each other. Kusatu made a strategic blunder in 94. Kusatu should have stood outside of the ANC so that they could poke them as and when they needed to. Instead, they stood inside and basically got decimated in the process. Um, they're losing unions, and, and, and ergo, we've got AMCU and other unions starting to rise up. Um, they're going to become significant. We've got the EFF, and the EFF is your proper revolutionary worker party. What the ANC is centrist. And, and the view that the party to rise up against the ANC would be a, 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 a centrist party is wrong because they are centrist. The party that will challenge the ANC is going to be left-wing. We've seen it in South America. We've seen it in Latin America. It will be a left-wing party. And that scares the behetness out of all of you. But it shouldn't. Because what do politicians do best? Talk rubbish. They stand up and they pontificate and they jump up and down and they say crazy, insane things and then they get into politics and they get luxury German sedans and drink expensive wine and whiskey and so on and so on. And the practicalities of what the EFF is looking for is lovely in rhetoric but not so practical in paper. So the EFF says that we should nationalize the mines. Frankly, they can have the mines. <laughs> I mean, there's some money to pay, right? I mean, how much do we really want for Lonman? Billion bucks, it's yours. I mean, I'm sure that someone, benefactor, can give them a bit. The EFF don't want Lonman. No, 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 no. They want the mines from 100 years ago when they, you know, printed money and, frankly, exploited the supporters from the EFF. That has passed. This is going to be driven. We get, we, what we're still seeing is the fall apart. Next year will be interesting. Local election, everyone will pretend the tripartite alliance will pretend everything is lovely and rosy. The EFF will rebel rise and scare the heck out of everyone except for their supporters, who are mostly the blue collar workers. <coughs> but ultimately, we've seen this break apart, and ultimately, the EFF is going to become significant. The key point is it's noise. And don't worry about what will the foreign investors think. The foreign investors don't give a hoot. What does a foreign investor, what does any investor care about? Profit. Profit. Ethical profit? Meh. Well, yes, if we can, nice. But really, profit. We want profit. You know, we can look at countries which have got track records 100 times worse than ours, and do they have lack of investors? No. If there's profit to be made, if there's risk-adjusted profit to be made, that's fine. I remember Polakwani when Zuma got in and the whole squabble, and I remember the, the, the hysteria, if Zuma wins, our market will crash. No, because the foreigners don't really give a hoot. You know, is Zuma going to build an Enkandla? Yes, but really a quarter of a billion rand in the big picture? Nah, no sweat. So the politicians will make noises, they will scare people, and the best advice is turn it off, unless you want to laugh. Now, this is real drought. I must say, my prediction there that it will last until the middle of next year is not my prediction. I'm not a farmer. This is the, the prediction coming from the experts around the weather and who actually know what they're talking about. Um, we got lucky. We should get a drought every 10 years. We missed the one 10 years ago. It saved us. But this is, a, this is absolutely real, and it's going to have massive implications in the new year. In the immediate, what we're seeing is, oddly enough, meat prices are coming down because farmers are slaughtering because they can't feed their animals, so they slaughter them. So suddenly there's a glut of meat onto the market, predominantly beef to a lesser degree pork and to a much lesser degree chicken, because chickens are a 44-day just period, and you can slaughter at 42 days, but you get a smaller size bird, and then you make less revenue. So mostly there's a, a, a glut of beef onto the market. Um, maize price goes up. Maize is an input into all meat. It's an input into dairy. It's an input into most of what you were eating out there a moment ago. Maize is somewhere everywhere. And that price rockets. But there's a bigger implication that happens. So when the rains eventually come, and let's assume that the drought is one year and the rains start to come back next year, is that we've got a farming space that has been significantly hurt. We've got to rebuild stocks of live, we've got to rebuild herds of livestock. We've got to rebuild the, the land that's, that's under irrigation and, and, and under farming and the like. And this doesn't happen. This isn't a switch you just do. It's easier than starting a mine, but it's not that easy a process. And the implications are your food producers, Pioneer, Tiger, 
Zeta maybe, I don't know, I've never, I mean, Zeta is just Pioneer, let's ignore Zeta. Pioneer and Tiger, and I know that Pioneer talked the talk and in their last set of results, they were like, no, no, we will pass the increases on, they can't. Margins are going to get squeezed, the costs are going to come up, they're not going to be able to pass it on to consumers, because why? They're going to go to Whitey Besson, and they're going to say, Mr. Besson, we need to up the price of X, and Mr. Besson's going to say, no, don't be silly, you want to hurt my market share? And if you've got Pioneer and Checkers, I mean, who wins every time? Checkers. Why? Because they are, well, for the correct name, ShopRite Checkers. And they're going to say, not interested. Thanks, but no thanks. And then, of course, there's Tiger Brands, but they've become a bit of a joke recently. Um, and that everything they buy just turns to mud. So the, the food producers are really going to get hurt. It's going to be a very tough year for them. And I know they're saying not, but they are wrong. It's going to be a very tough year for them. A step from that, aside from the food producers, is the retailers are going to take some pressure because there is going to be cost increases across the board. Whitey Besson can't completely squash the costs. So he is going to see the pressures coming through. So it is going to mean that the consumer is going to have less disposable income. It means that we're going to see margins being squeezed. It's going to be exceedingly tough in the producers. It's going to be very tough in the retailers. My favorite two retail stocks in the world, one is Woolies. And Woolies isn't a problem. You know what? I mean, margins aren't a problem at Woolies. I mean, you just go there and you shop there because it's Woolies. And because they took that piece of steak and they put three pieces of plastic on it. We pay premium for three pieces. And they have an expiry date, which is approximately eight minutes into the future. So you've got to run home and cook your steak in a hurry. ShopRite, I, at the current price points, below 140, ShopRite is an attractive price to me. And I did buy some the other day with my money from, from, from MTN. But I'm buying it very gently because I don't think they're going to have a, a soaring next year. Notwithstanding, forward dividend yield on ShopRite, 3%. Forward price earnings, 16 This is a stock that had a forward price earnings of 34 just three years ago. So it's come down massively in valuations. But 2016 is not going to be a boom year for any of the, of the, of the, the, of the food retailers. Industrials, so the ND25 has been the space to be in since, since the crisis. I mean, if you, if you held ND25 stocks, you've done brilliantly. It's likely to be the winning sector in 2016, if only because I can't see the Resi or the Finney coming to the party. So it's a case of, well, okay, uh, what have we got? And it's going to be the usual suspects, the Mondays, the British American tobaccos. Turns out that they've been bribing politicians. We expected nothing less. Um, no, come on. Look, I'm a smoker, but you sell cigarettes. I mean, that's a dodgy business. Of course you bribe politicians. Uh, you know, Capco, SAB, except SAB will be gone by this time next year, and we'll get uh, AB InBev. And I have no idea about AB InBev, except, you know, again, what we have is a fairly small concentrated market. AB InBev will be a significant player in that market. But I don't know if it's going to do the same sort of shooting the lights out that we've seen from SAB in the last couple of years. Remember, SAB, for a very long time, has been trading on that supposed premium that AB InBev would one day come and buy them. A and so they did. Um, I'm not sure if AB InBev will be as exciting a stock as we've seen from it. So broadly, I think that the industrials, financials, yeah. so you want to love the banks, right? Because everyone in this room has multiple bank accounts. No one has none. No one has just one or two. You've got current account, check account, vehicle savings. You've got a share trading account, probably owned by a bank. You've got a home loan. You've got a small, and so the list goes on. And every month you get a statement, and if you read it, you'll get to that line that says fees. They don't call it fees, do they? They call it something which is confusing. And you run your eye across, and you see a surprisingly large number, and you think, hey, now, nah, I'm being ripped off. And there we are, all of us with three, four, five, six bank accounts. I mean, isn't that a beautiful business to own? Own an account that rips you off, but your friends, your family, your loved ones, your colleagues, your enemies, rip off everyone in the room. But there's just something about them, and, and, and I'll divvy them up in a moment, but if we look at the big four, there's something about them, the valuations are okay, but I'm not sure where their massive growth is going to come from. If we've got food prices increasing, it's a consumer under pressure. Um, if we've got interest rates going up locally, that's further pressure on a consumer. That means less borrowing, it means more bad debt. I'm just not sure how these banks get exciting. 
If we touch particularly on Standard Bank, they've got some issues, perhaps. They lost a billion rands worth of aluminium in China. That might be a nasty thing to say, but it, if you're a shareholder, it's a billion rand they don't have. They got fined half a billion rand by the Office of Serious Economic Crimes or whatever in the UK last week, admittedly for something that happened a long time ago and for something which they confessed to. Um, they've got some issues in Nigeria. Are they real or not? I, I'm not sure. Um, but none of the big four excite me. The, the bank that excites me is Capitec. Own it, have owned it for almost a decade now. Um, it's not an expensive bank. Historic PE, 22. Can they do 22 times earnings next year? Sure. Are they African bank? No chance. They've got very, very stringent and, and very, very aggressive risk control policies. When you take a loan, they immediately assume that a third are going to go bust. You miss a payment, boom, you're a bad debt. They're over-provisioned. Their provisions are 186% of what their model says they need. We're getting a cap on interest rates in the new year. Um, will it impact Capitec? Yes, but only a little bit, partly because <coughs> the interest rates weren't at the extreme levels that they could charge, and secondly, because they can actually take their insurance policies out and do them separately and give themselves a little more wiggle room. It will hurt earnings, but not massively. They will start bringing in new products, home loans via SA Home Loan, so they don't have to manage the process, they don't have to use their balance sheet, but they get the foot traffic and the loyalty. Vehicle finance, credit cards, and the key thing they do is they give you a bank account for five rand sixty. What can you buy for five rand sixty? Honest question. I can't think of a single thing. It's not even half a dollar. Five rand sixty. Uh, you can buy a single loose cigarette. Ah, but that's illegal. You're not allowed to buy loose cigarettes. So you can buy nothing for five rand sixty, but you can get a Capitec bank account. My bank account cost me 285 rand a month because I have a private banker who phones me my birthday and wishes me happy birthday. <laughs> Takes me half an hour to realize who it was who phoned me because I'd never speak to this person as a rule. And why haven't I moved across? Because it's not the birthday wishes, but they're offering good old-fashioned cheap banking. And there's a critical point with Capitec. Cost to income ratio, 35%. In other words, of every buck they receive, 35 cents on costs. The big four? Every buck they receive, 55 cents in costs. Why? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. There's a corporate investment, although that should be higher margin. The key reason is legacy systems. Capitec only started 13 years ago, and they started with a clean slate and a computer in front of them. The other big four banks, with all the respects in the world, started with an abacus. They've still, somewhere in their safe, they have pieces of paper with things written on them. So the fact that Capitec is late to the party means they've come with real tech. It means that they can keep their costs down. Now, that cost-to-income ratio creeps up, yes. But is Capitec going to 55%? Can't see it. More importantly, are the big five banks going sub-50? I remember chatting with Jack Maria, who was then still CEO at Standard Bank. Um, it was their results in 2011. And their cost to income was 56. And in the olden days, the big banks used to have cost to incomes around 51, 52. And I said to him, will these cost to income ratios, I said to him, how long before they get back to the low 50s? And he said to me, never. He says, banking is different. The regulation, the compliance, post the 08 crisis and the like, he said, they're never going back to where they once were. He says, the mid 50s is the best we can hope for. And on that, it's really, it's Capitec. And I know what you're thinking, yo, but it's 575 rand. And it was a buck 13 years ago. Yeah, well, we missed the one buck 13 years ago. The point is, forget what it's done. Remember the recency bias? That trends continue for longer than you ever imagine. So when I was doing this presentation, starting it about a week ago, Capitec was 620. And I looked at that, and I thought, yeah. And then it goes to 560. And it's like, man, at that price, it's actually attractive again. It's not cheap. It's fair value. How much quality is fair value in our market? Not much. I mean, is, is, is NASPAS quality, sure, fair value, yeah, maybe. Uh, Capco, it's expensive. SAB is expensive. British American Tobacco, expensive. We've got quality, but we pay for it. Maybe here's quality we don't have to pay for. Well, we pay for it, but we only pay fair value for it. Construction, pain's going to continue. Here's the issue with the construction companies. Is what happened is it's really tough in South Africa um, when you can't sort of 
you know, do dodgy deals. So they decide to move to the rest of Africa. They decide to move to Australia. Two problems. Africa and the rest of Africa and Australia are mining economies. Well, guess what? So we are, and guess what? There ain't no mining happening. Other problem is they land in Lusaka or, 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 or Sydney, and what do they discover? Well, they discover the local operators. They discover the other South African companies have also landed. They discover that the Brazilian, Italian, Spanish companies are also there. Construction's become a global game. So what happens? You fight on price. I mean, no disrespect to civil engineers. My father built bridges, which he assured me were beautiful bridges. I don't know, as long as I don't fall down, I love them. A bridge is a bridge, right? Yes, we can make it pretty. But how's my bridge different from yours? Assuming neither falls down, one's got to be cheaper. And if your only competitive edge is price, you don't have a competitive edge. What you have is a race to the bottom. And in a race to the bottom, the best thing to do is just not get involved. He didn't even want to watch because this is going to get ugly. I, I think we're going to see one go bust. Um, Easily, and, and, it's, and go look at the price charts of our big, uh, of, <laughs> we don't have any big construction companies. Go look at the price charts of our small construction companies, because they're all small these days, um, and you can pretty see which ones, you know, it, it, it's just stay away from construction. They've got no edge, they've got nothing going for them. Um, it's just not a space. You want to be winning stocks and winning sectors, and, and, and construction can, is not a winning sector. We, they're critical. Economies need them. Just... We don't need, uh, Jean-Pierre Fiste said it once, just because a share is there doesn't mean we need to buy it. In this case, just because a sector is there doesn't mean we need to buy it. So will construction blip along? Yeah. Um, if anything, my view on construction, short the bounces. If, you, if, you're taking, if, you, if you're doing derivatives, if you're taking short positions, when they bounce, Wilson Bailey, go look at a weekly chart. It's collapsing, but every so often, every six, eight, 12 months, it bounces. And when it bounces, you short it, and it collapses, and you're in business again. Um, and the one I think might go bust, I look at Avenge, and I don't know how they survive. And then commodities. Short answer, more of the same. Um, but I think we've seen the worst behind us. I mean, are we going to see the level of the route that we saw this year? I mean. We, they, 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 there's no more routing left to route. I mean, Kumba's gone from 600 to 50. Although, as someone said, uh, what is a stock that's fallen 90%? Well, it's a stock that fell 80% and then halved. So the fact that Kumba has gone from 60 to 50 and is down uh, whatever that is, 87% or something, uh, it doesn't mean it can't fall further. The problem with commodities is, is, is the good old-fashioned economics 101, supply, and demand. And what we saw in the, 2000, in the lead up to 2007, 2008, and in fact it continued up to about 2010, was demand like we had never seen before on planet Earth. We had a country of 1.2 billion people, China, who were industrializing at a rate that we'd never seen before. You've heard about the ghost cities, and if you haven't, go to YouTube and type in uh, uh, China ghost cities. There are cities for 300,000 people, and there's no one living there. You know what the Chinese are saying? Yeah, no one living there today, but build it and they will come. 350 million Chinese people have, since the turn of the century, gone from rural to urban. And that's what those cities are for. And that required a humongous amount of commodities. The, uh, 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 the power stations that were being built are just gobsmacking. This, not just in the size, but in the quantity that were being built. Roads, high-speed trains, entire cities, ports. And the thing with infrastructure is you build it ahead of the need. You don't wait for the need and then build it. You build it, and then for years, everyone calls it a white elephant. And when I say years, like 10, 20 years, everyone calls it a white elephant, and eventually the, 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 the utilization increases and it starts to work. We've got it with Kucha down in the Eastern Cape. But eventually, it start, you've got to build it in advance of its need. You can't build it after the fact, because you can't grow without it. So it has to go in advance. And that's what China did. And what that meant was that they sucked in resources on an unprecedented scale. Copper, iron ore, uh, steel, everything except your precious, your gold and your platinum, less so. But they absolutely sucked it in. 
So much so that everyone wanted to become a, a, an iron ore miner. Ixara was so desperate to become an iron ore miner, they rushed off to Central Africa and bought a mine for 7.6 billion rand, but forgot to secure a railway line to get it to port. Now I'm deadly serious. And then when they discovered the small error, they had to write down the 7.6 billion because iron ore is no good if you can't get it to port. At the point, iron ore was 150 tons. Today, iron ore is sub 40. The long-term price point for iron ore is 30 or 40 dollars a ton. That's it. Combus all in cost of production, about 32 dollars a ton. Rio and BHP Billiton, about 21. I'm not saying Kumba's going bust. I am saying that Kumba's crazy margins are behind them. They used to have an operating margin of 70%. That is gone. If they get operating margins at 20%, they're going to be dancing in, 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 what's that place in the middle of nowhere? Session. So what we saw was a demand like we have never seen before. When I say never, I mean certainly in the last 100, 120 years, we had never seen that level of demand before. We had never seen a country industrialize at such a pace, with such precision. And that's because of the nature of China, in that they are a centrally controlled economy. They're communist, but they're capitalist. But the point is, when they say, we will build power station, they build it. End of story. Next question. And when they say it will be finished on Tuesday, it's finished on Tuesday. Because in truth, if it's not, probably someone gets shot. <laughs> no, it's... it's, it's, it's it's true. I mean, we laugh because it's tragic, but it's true. So what did that do? When you see increase in demand, massive increase in demand, price goes up. When you see price goes up, the suppliers are like, whoa, I want to get on that. Off they go and they produce. Now the demand has disappeared. China is changing from industrialization. They've built the cities. Now they're changing to turn their, 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 their people into consumers. The demand has collapsed. The super cycle demand we saw is not returning with one exception. India, maybe. But India hasn't got that same level of state control to manage it. So the demand that we saw is not coming back. Yet we have supply that is quantums ahead. The one stat I saw, and I haven't been able to verify it, so I didn't put it on the screen, is that Rio and Billiton alone produce more iron ore than this, than this planet needs. Two companies produce more than the planet needs. So if everyone shuts down, we still have oversupply. Now, even if that's an extreme and not accurate stat, it gives you an indication. So commodities are going to get ugly. What do we need? We need supply out of the picture. And we don't need Glencore shutting a copper mine that no one had heard of before they shut it down. We need proper supply out of the picture. We need major players going bust, not minor players going bust. I don't think Kumbazit, Lonman, I... If, if platinum doesn't go to 1500 in the next year, Lonman's not going to make it through. This money they've got is not going to last them beyond the end of next year. So we, will, we might start to see prices, but short answer, don't buy it. This, this, this commodity story remains ugly. A couple of, of important points. Rand helps, of course. Weaker Rand helps a bit. In truth, Imagine what our commodity stocks would be doing if our RAND wasn't at 14.35. Imagine if our RAND was at 10, and where our commodity stocks would be with the RAND at 10. They, 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 their bacon has been more than saved by an absolute collapse in our currency. Um, but it's simply not enough. And if RAND starts to tick stronger, they're in deep trouble. Oil will remain weak. OPEC's theory, we will cut supply. OPEC hasn't stuck to quotas this millennial. And o o OPEC, were, their heyday was the 70s. OPEC are, yes, they can have their meetings and their tea and biscuits, but, but OPEC no longer control global oil. No one sticks to it. Even if they did stick to it, some American is going to go and frack some gas and, and completely disrupt that. Point is, when do we buy commodities? So two things. To me, commodity companies are never a bottom draw stock. They are a buy, hold, and then exit. The exit is quite simple. The first bit of bad news you see, the first trading statement that's not as positive as the previous one, the first set of results that are not as great as the previous set of results, you cut and you run. I sold my Kumbas at 480. They went to 620. I looked like a fool. 
and now I look like a genius. Well, okay, I could have sold higher. But they issued a trading update about three and a half years ago, which was less bullish than usual. And I'm that, that's it, game over. Last point, and then my next slide. Markets look forward, right? So if commodities are starting to increase in 2017, we'll see commodity stocks perhaps picking up their heads in 2016. Maybe. I am not convinced. But here's when you buy them, when the price has doubled. When a commodity company, and I'm talking single commodity producers here, when that price of the share has doubled, then you buy it. And you think I'm crazy. If Lonman price, sorry, Kumba's price doubles, it's not even 100 bucks. Kumba doubles, it's not even 100 rand. Is Kumba going back to 600? Probably not. But could it go to two, three, four hundred? Maybe, in a frothy, overheated market. So the single commodity producers, and I exclude Lonman here, because when you're at 23 cents, doubling is just a finger error, hey? <laughs> the single commodity producers, excluding Lonman, when their price has doubled, we buy it. And you're saying, well, but we've missed the money. No, you've made a risk-adjusted short-term investment. By waiting for the doubling, you are significantly reducing the risk. And these stocks have been so killed that this Anglo doubles, it's not even 200 rand. Man, I can remember people telling me when Anglo was 400 rand that this thing was so cheap you had to buy it. And then at 300, and then at 200, and then at 100. When they double, then we buy them. Until they double, we spectators. And if they run up 70%, we don't buy them. When they double, then we buy them, and then we make some money from it. And then we'll hold them for two, three, maybe four years. These are not geared positions. You just buy the equity. But first, we want the red arrow to be green, and we want it to be up 100%. So SA Inc., GDP, 2% if we're lucky. Excuse me, I don't think we'll get a recession. Uh, top 40, I think our best bet for next year is flat. My prediction for next year is that we will probably be single-digit negative for top 40. What we're seeing is rather than having a crash, is we're seeing an unwinding of valuations by market goes sideways, earnings increases, maybe not by much. Maybe that increase is only 10 or 15%. But that unwinds the, the valuations there. We've also got a top 40, which is weird. We've got a whole bunch of very high-priced stocks, NASPAS, SAB, British American Tobacco. And if we took them out, our market is not expensive. Of course, we've also got a couple of very sort of, what do you want to call them? Resource stocks. I'm trying to think of a nickname for them. Resource stocks down at the bottom, which are supposedly very cheap, but in truth, in the, through the cycles, maybe not quite so. Point being is... If we take out the half flyers, our market's not massively expensive, but we're unwinding that valuation. Are we going to see a correction down to 40,000? I would hope so. I would be very happy if our top 40 went down to 48, maybe 30, sorry, 40, maybe 38,000 would give lack a buying opportunity. Point being is, this is not an exciting economy to be in, and I think our top 40 is going to be flat at best next year, otherwise negative. Caveat, I mean, even if the RAND went to 16, I mean, from 14.50 to 16 is, is, is not enough to save our top 40. And this year, as we speak, we're in a top 40, which is flat. I mean, it depends where we are in the day. I don't know where we close today, but we're in a top 40, which is pretty much just flat. Um, so South Africa, I'm expecting it to be flat at best. My focus will be on a couple of stocks. I'm going to come back to them at the end of the presentation. China. So everyone is deeply freaked out because China is not growing at 7%. Hang on a second. The second biggest economy in the world. You know what? Growing, at, growing the second big... When America grows at 2%, everyone's like, it's not bad. Could do better. You know, well, what do you say in the report card? Should try harder. America does 3 or 4%. People are doing cartwheels. This is the second biggest economy in the world. I get it. There's a fundamental difference between it and, 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 and the U.S. And although it's massively big by the nature of 1 point whatever billion people, it is an economy that is, 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 is needs to grow at a faster rate. It can't grow at America's rate. But the point is that if China's not doing 7, everyone goes into an absolute humongous panic. The world is ending. Um, and when it does grow at 7, they tell you the numbers are dodgy. Trust me. All numbers are dodgy. You know what America does? Every time they release a set of data, they go and revise the previous set of data. 
uh, okay, I mean, noted. So forget, the point is, China will continue to grow. Is it doing 7%, 5%, 5% will scare people, but big answer, China at 5%, that is a humongous, humongous economy. And that at 5% is doubling every 14 years, which is insane. As I said, it's about the industrialization moving into con 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 uh, consumerization, which means consumer products, which means Richmond, which means NASPAS, which means discovery. Chinese want what we want. They want iPhones, they want McDonald's, and they want healthcare. And they want telecommunications and all of those sort of boring things. They're no different from us. Key differences, there's a humongous number of them, and they are growing at rapid rates. China's a significant player. New leader in China, uh, number 11. I really caught him that on TV. Well, it comes up. I, 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 must, I know that you say that somewhere else on a teleprompter. Point being is, he's, he's Chinese. He's Communist Party. He's slightly reformist. What he is doing is clamping down on corruption. This might have been hurting Richmond, no gifting, as they call it, and the like. That's fine. But you know what? Are, are, are people still going to be buying expensive watches? And when I talk expensive watches, I don't mean the watches that the local politicians wear. I mean really expensive watches. Richmond has a watch that sells for six and a half million pounds. Hundred and, let's call it 150 million rand. 150 million rand. And then you put it on your wrist. <laughs> and you walk around. I mean, or do you put it in the safe? And that makes even less sense. Um, China will be fine. China will be absolutely fine. There's an ETN. Uh, exchange traded note, Deutsche Bank China. It's actually Hong Kong stocks that operate in China. My preferred exposure for China is Richmond Discovery. Richmond selling high priced watches, moving to a degree away from branded watches and into bespoke jewelry because they're significantly better markup. They can manage the processes better. Um, and don't be stressed when the other high end players have tough times. Um, Hermes, whatever they're called, all those other players this, you know, have results which are not excellent. They are not Richmond. Richmond is a special beast. Richmond is something else. And the one thing we managed to do in South Africa incredibly well is make some astounding companies. Richmond is one. SAB Miller is another. I mean, yeah, NASPAS bought an astounding company. But we have a lot of really, really good global companies. Richmond is one of them. And they... If you wanted to buy the best luxury company in the world and put it in your drawer for 20 years, the one to buy, if you could buy any one of them, you'd buy Richmond. Absolutely, you'd buy Richmond. So that's my China play. Discovery I'll come to in a second. The USA, Clinton will beat Bush. Yeah, I don't know. But American politics, man. Um, who knows? Trump might win. I wonder who his running mate would be. Huh, that would be fun. Um, they're going to get rate increases, if not next Wednesday, and I hope Ms. Yellen can hold off just one more meeting because I have a bottle of whiskey, um, Japanese whiskey at that. But they're going to start pushing up rates, but they're going to do it very, 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 very carefully because if they start pushing rates, money's going to start rushing in. And they don't want all that money rushing in because they don't want that to happen to their dollar. They would like some of the money to stay in Europe. But I think, I mean, the last unemployment number, 5% unemployment. Now, statistically, you can't get, I mean, 5% is considered to be full employment. There's always a transition of people who are, you know, moving in between unemployed. The theory is you can't get your unemployment below 5%. America is therefore currently sitting at full unemployment. Of course, the caveat is discouraged workers who have left the labor force who will come back into the labor force. I hear you on that. But this is an economy that is working. This is an economy that is doing incredibly well. And you've got to say, one of the reasons, actually three of them, quantitative easing. Quantitative easing one, quantitative easing two, and then quantitative easing kitchen sink. Remember when Janet Yellen said, actually, we'll just do whatever it takes. And understand quantitative easing. What are they doing? They're buying American debt. So everyone's like, well, how do they pay it back? Mm, they don't. It expires. More than that, they earn interest. They're actually making money, not in the short term, but over the long term. When we come back in 30 years and look back at the global financial crisis of 08, 09, quantitative easing would have earned American citizens money, would have made a profit for them. It worked. 
the economy is strong. Are there problems in the economy? Of course, yes. If nothing else, it's full of politicians. And I've got to stress, and I say it again, politicians are the same the world over. Julius Valema, Donald Trump, I mean, <laughs> one's got funny hair, one's got a beret, same thing. <laughs> My preference is DBX world, I'll touch on why in a moment, but there is the DBX US as well. European Union, so European Union is complicated because it's 21 countries, it includes the Italians, the Germans, the Portuguese, I mean, these people have never liked each other, right? They've spent the last thousand years fighting each other, and now they've got to try and do things. Um, firstly, they are finally doing quantitative easing, and as I just said, it works. The problem is they came late to the party, and the other problem is that Super Mario Draghi doesn't have the level of freedom that uh, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen had, for a simple reason, because he's got 21 masters. It's bad enough having one boss. They will get it through, they will muddle along, they will do all right, they will make some returns, there are some quality companies there. Greece will again be in our front pages at some point in 2016. On that, I will bet anyone a bottle of whiskey, and I will bet you a second bottle of whiskey that Greece does not matter. No one cares, except the media. When you hear about Greece, change the channel. Watch something else. There is DBX EU, which is quite interesting. That tracks the Eurostoxx 50. 50 largest uh, 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 companies in Europe, dominated by France and Germany. No surprises there. Uh, again, I prefer DBX World. I'll come to why in a moment. Um, so, 2016. I think it's about mostly offshore. And that doesn't mean necessarily move your money offshore. My view of moving money offshore is you only do that if you physically go, if you plan to one day join your money offshore. If you don't plan to join the money offshore, then, then, then I, you, know, you, you can get the exposure just as perfectly by buying the Richemonts of the world and the like, the NASPASs and whatever it is. But I would certainly skew a portfolio to offshore. Um, Local GDP at 2% means that those local companies, and a lot of small caps are in that space. I mean, I'm just going to rattle names that, can, that spring to mind, Accentuate, uh, Equestra, um, and then my mind goes blank. But these small companies, by their nature of smallness, are so de dependent on SA Inc. because they're not global companies. And that's where they're going to find it hard. That's going to be the tough space. The bigger guys who've gone offshore, and still might have their roots in South Africa, are going to survive and do significantly better. So th there's a few exceptions. I'll come to those in a, in, in a moment. But my sense is that it's going to be, as uh, much as I'm expecting the top 40 to be flat, within that, winners and losers. Losers will be resources. Losers will be SA Inc. Imperial springs to mind. It's not fun being Imperial at the moment. You know, logistics, uh, uh, couriers, whatever, all that. In an economy which is growing at 2%, you're not making much of anything. Um, you're much better with those companies that have that global exposure. And that's, I mean, probably always a good idea for a portfolio, but I think especially so for next year. Um, the RAND might take some of the shine off that offshore, but I think the RAND is not going to 12.50 in a blink of an eyelid. It'll be a grinding slow. And it's not going to be like we saw in 2001 where the RAND went from 13.61, and at exactly that point, everyone took money offshore, and then it went down to 5.75. We're not going to see that again. I mean, maybe we get to 10 at best, which is a less than a one-third, 30% in, uh, increase. We're not going to see a, a halving of it by any stretch. To me, it's about the U.S. It's about the U.S. and China. China, we get via proxies, but the U.S. is your, almost your banker, and China's your, 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 your sweetener. It's boring, I know, the U.S., but you know what? Right now, that's what it is. EU, yeah, I, I, I like the EU, but not enough to go and go directly into it. And I want to come back to the point again, the election. So what is an election meant to do? Scare you. The sole purpose of having an election is to scare the population. Because then you go and vote. And if I can make you more scared than that politician, you're going to vote for me. It's about instilling fear. Because fear is about control. And the control they want is not to rampage through the streets. The control they want is your vote. So they're going to say crazy things. So Julius Valema is going to stand up at some point and call Mandela names that we can't even imagine. He's going to stand up at some point and say, forget marching on ABSA. We're going to repossess ABSA. And you know what? He can't, and, and it's what politicians do. And we're going to see it from all the parties. It's what they do. 
You know the joke, how do you know a politician is lying? Lips are moving. So there will be lots of noise. Ignore it. Go and vote. Important, this is a local election. Only vote if the person you're voting for actually bothers to tell you who they are and what they want your vote for. My little community, I have no idea who my person is, so I've never voted in a local election. So the stocks for 2016. Um, bunches of warnings, disclaimers, be careful, own risk, and all of that sort of stuff. No resources until 100% move. My preferred is DBXWD. Here's why. Worldwide, currently 53% US, 12% uh, EU, 11% Japan and United Kingdom. The thing is that if Japan starts becoming a uh, well, Japan or the EU, let's say the EU surprises us all and suddenly starts storming ahead, what will happen? The EU waiting in that basket will increase. And whichever one is losing ground will decrease. It's only developed markets, so there's no China or anything in here, no South Africa, basically Western Europe, North America, and other bits and pieces. But that is my preferred ETF for, for offshore. I, I own the US for legacy reasons. I bought it before I understood what WD was, but I don't buy US anymore. Uh, Richmond, for reasons as explained earlier, gives you great China exposure. It gives you great rich people exposure. Uh, and what do we read all the time about inequality, about how the rich are getting richer, about how Mark Zuckerberg is 32 and worth $45 billion. Do you want to feel a failure at life? Man, I'm 46, and I'm not even worth 42 billion rand, never mind dollars. He has made $1.5 billion a year his entire life, including when he was in nappies. Yeah. Santova, here is my flying little high-risk thing. And I know what you're all saying. Oh, but Santova's gone from 20 cents to 4 rand. You don't want to buy that. Of course you do. Every stock's gone from 20 cents to... Richmond once went from 20 cents to 4 rand. Don't worry where it's come from. Worry where it's going. What is Santova? Non-asset-based logistics company. What does that mean? They don't own trucks, but if you need to move something from A to B, they will make it happen. Half of their revenue is now offshore. They bought a little asset recently in Germany. They bought a little asset recently in the UK. Um, they're Durban-based. Yes, I'm biased. I'm from Durban. But they're a great little company, and I think they've got huge potential. Their balance sheet looks a little stressed because they have debt, but that's because they will loan money to their, to the, to their customers, basically in terms of moving the cargo from A to B. But those loans are secured by the cargo, so there's no stress. Basically, you move cargo, they'll pay you 80% of the value when you deliver it, and then they receive the money at the other end and they pay you the rest then. So that's why their balance sheet sometimes looks a little bit stressed. It is, uh, and the star means I own it. It is your uh, spicy one for the year, but what the heck. Aspen, so here's a global company, again from Durban. Again, a little stock that was 50 cents in 1997 when uh, uh, they took over Adrian Saad, uh, Stephen Saad, uh, took over SA Druggist, I think it was called, uh, for 50 cents a share. I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard, and now they whatever. Everyone loves Aspen and says, oh, we wish we could have bought it cheaper. Well, here's your chance. 320, 330, way better price than the 420 you would have bought a year ago. Are people still taking drugs? Yeah. Are drugs defensive to, 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 to economic conditions? Yeah. If you're sick, you're sick. They've got uh, generics. Do people like generics? You betcha. Cheap drugs. You like them. Well, you don't care. Your medical aid likes them. It saves you and your medical aid and the like. They're very much global. Understand that Glasgow Klein Smith still aims, owns a slice. At some point, Glasgow Klein Smith will sell that stake. And when that happens, the market will panic, the stock will fall, and your job is to buy some. Discovery. This, I did a presentation in February. I was looking for the best share on the JSC to own. I expected to come out with a little small cap, and instead, Discovery popped up as the best share, head and shoulders, to own on the JSC. I am looking for a 20-bagger over 10 years, and Discovery comes to it. Two quick reasons. Puan in China is nothing, but might be something massive. There's structural changes happening in China. People are moving away from state health to wanting insurance. That's going to take a long time, because right now, you don't do that in China. It's not how it works, but they're working on it. The bigger thing is vitality. When John Hancock, the biggest life insurer in America, comes to you and says, please, can we license your vitality? You know that they have tried to reverse engineer that product. You know they've tried to pull it apart. When they come knocking, you know they have failed to pull it apart, and you know that you have an awesome, awesome product. 
discovery is, if you're going to own one share, to my mind, it's discovery. And they're always going to be sick people. And are they expensive in terms of the money you pay every month to subscribe? You betcha. And as a shareholder, love it. I am not a client of Discovery. I'm a shareholder of Discovery. <laughs> Capitec, Colgo, a famous brand. So those were the three I had last year. So I say I like them, the but. So what, I'm not, what I hate doing is, is these predictions things. And you come along a year later and you forget about what you said last year and you assume that you sold them. Firstly, if you're holding them, continue to hold. Would I buy Colgo M3 at this point? Mm, I would buy it if it gets down into the 16, 17s. At this point, it's not cheap. Um, and it, election years will work for it because the government quickly goes and builds a whole lot of houses and Colgo has to build them. So they'll have good numbers for next year. But I'm not sure I'd rush and buy them. Famous brands. So you know what? The consumer's under pressure. You know what? That's terrible for, for you would think a company like Famous Brands. Except what is Famous Brands really all about? Time-pressed individuals. People who haven't got time to cook dinner and they swing by a Famous Brands on the way home. And yes, those are the, 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 the 10 percenters. It's more than the 1 percenters. These are, are not the folks who don't have jobs. But there are a lot of people in this, com in this country, um, as they expand north into the continent and other parts as well, who really are about saying it's, it's, it, it's about convenience. It's about, you know what, it's half past 7 and Johnny needs to eat before 8 o'clock and I haven't got the, oh, I'm buying him whatever is on the way home and they manage their prices. And again, it's about excellence. Yes, they don't have brands like Domino's or, or, or uh, Starbucks. You know what? They don't need them. Yes, they're losing Kevin Hedwig, who drove this process, but they will survive without Kevin Hedwig. This is an amazing company that will continue to be amazing for a very long time. Capitec, I've told you already, love it, would always want to own it. Keep your ETFs, never sell your ETFs, always keep your ETFs, and always Max out your tax-free savings account. 30000 per year. Tax year, you've got until end of February. First money always goes into your tax-free savings account. When that is maxed out, we go and buy the individual stocks. The government is giving you free money. They never do that. Grab it. Both hands. Bloodhound, so when I was a young boy, 1983, Thrust 2, that gold car, was going to set the land speed record. And I had a little cardboard cutout, and I cut it out, and I glued it together, and I whizzed it down the roads and stuff, and it absolutely captured my imagination. And they did beat the land speed record, and it was awesome. For I don't even know where I was living in 1983. It was probably in the sticks. You heard about it via the magazines, not even newspapers or TVs. And in October of this year, of next year, rather, Bloodhound is coming to the Northern Cape to attempt to do one thousand miles an hour. That is bliximumly fast, although that is not a motor car. So I have two predictions to make. One, I will be there, and two, they will beat it. And I recommend everyone goes there. I have no idea what Huxkeen Pan looks like. Apparently it's by Upperting, Uppington. Apparently Uppington has a donkey uh, made out of concrete or something. I don't know. It just sounds, man, it's something to do, hey? So I think we should all go to Huxkeen Pan in Northern Cape. And see the Bloodhound do one thousand miles an hour. Most that's fast. That's maximally fast. Uh, last slide. I put a poll up this morning on Twitter uh, asking people what their predictions for the top 40 in 2016 is. You can vote until 10 tomorrow morning. I expected more people to be negative. The biggest shift I've seen from a year ago is a year ago, if I had asked that question, I would have had 80, 85% of people being negative. I'm quite surprised by the 44% positive number. And that's about 100 odd votes, so it's not, it's not statistically relevant, but it's not, comp you know, it's not three of my closest friends and my pet cat. Um, and I'm surprised by the level of positivity for our index because I voted negative. That was my vote. Um, but so here's your thing so we can mark you guys next year. Is boogie along to uh, Simon PB on Twitter, twitter.com slash Simon PB. Uh, it's about the three tweets down. Tell us what you think uh, 2016 will be, negative or positive. Um, it's going to be a tough year. But tough years are just what happens occasionally. Um, it is a year we can still make money. It's just, and, and you know, folks will tell you it's about a year about being clever. No, it's always about being clever. Hey? There's never, oh yeah, this year it's about being stupid. No, stupid's, stupid's absolutely never an option whatsoever. Um, and I'm going to park it then. I've run my time, so I'm going to quickly conclude with a few points. Uh, 
I said right up front, it's more about the predictions tell you more about the person than about the future 100%. I touched on recency bias. Key point, I think, perhaps this evening, more than anything, and, and, and I'm happy to put my head in the, my block and we'll be here in a year and you will mark me again. But more than anything, it's about hopefully giving you some nuggets, something to think about, something that resonated with you. Um, maybe you disagree on a point. Contact details, mail me, chat to me now afterwards, find me on the Twitters and the like. It's about the engaging, it's about, it's about, it's about the discussions and about the thoughts. None of us can see into the future. There's no crystal balls, there's absolutely none of that. Remember, always, the lawyers. So that font is far too big for lawyers, we need smaller font. Um, so that's my say for this evening. I've run my time. I apologize for that. If you've got questions, come chat to me, email me, tweet me. I don't want to hold people up. Uh, I will just, to finish, a huge thank you. Uh, thank you to the speakers who spoke during the year. I don't know if anyone else has arrived. We were expecting some others. Uh, a huge thanks to the JSC. I'm not going to name names because I'll forget names, but for the folks who helped put this together. Uh, the Just One Lab team, Christia van Heerden and, and Mr. Klagwangwa, I can name them. Uh, to my wife, who I've done a 1,000 presentations in 15 years. This is only the second one she's ever seen. Um, yeah, I'm like with you, just like. And uh, of course, most of all, a huge thanks to all of you folks for supporting us, for coming through when we uh, for downloading the videos and asking the questions. I hope you have uh, awesome holidays. I hope everything you wish for in 2016 comes true, and I hope your investments do astoundingly brilliant things. Thank you very much for your time this evening. <laughs>